We are now going to hear back from somebody who's been busy having a brainstorming session. And the title of that brainstorming session was Ecological Compensation that Helps Achieve Biodiversity Targets. So it's my great pleasure to introduce a biodiversity and ecosystem services specialist. Uh, Fabian Kittier is from Biotope, which is one of Europe's largest biodiversity consultants and I think they've been working very hard in that workshop because they've had to get their calculators out to try and find a new approach uh, to offsetting a biodiversity. So Fabian, welcome. First question to you, uh, what is biodiversity offsetting? Um, well, it's, it's a key uh, approach, a key component to uh, getting biodiversity uh, to, to be taken into consideration in other sectors of the economy and the decisions of, of businesses, uh, developers. Um, uh, and it's a key step in, in what is more generally called uh, the mitigation hierarchy, whereby a developer with a project that might have an impact on biodiversity uh, has to seek to first avoid those impacts, minimize any impacts that couldn't be avoided. Uh, and then, because there are usually residual impacts on biodiversity, just from uh, the spatial footprint of a project, for example, uh, there is increasingly a requirement to uh, offset that residual impact by carrying out conservation or restoration actions elsewhere, uh, and thereby, thereby getting uh, the developer in that sector, a mining company, a road uh, project, for example, to act to actively contribute to conservation and restoration in in the landscape in which it's operating. Um, so it's a it's it's not a new concept, mm -hmm. uh, but it has uh, gotten a lot of attention uh, in in recent years, and it's in, it's now an increasing. Uh, it's increasingly a requirement both from national regulations, uh, uh, environmental laws in, in many countries around the world, and many development institutions, uh, the financial institutions that, that finance uh, development projects uh, across the world, including European institutions, uh, also require this mitigation hierarchy now for most of their projects. And Tell us, how does it actually relate to managing protected areas? Well, one of the um, examples that we discussed uh, in our session today uh, was the case of the Republic of Congo, where uh, some, uh, so this is in Central Africa, lots of um, intact forest landscapes there, uh, but also a lot of development projects, uh, roads, mines, um, and in that country, uh, protected areas are, are uh, uh, poorly funded, not always adequately managed. Uh, and so there is uh, a strong call uh, from conservation organizations to channel resources that the private sector makes available through this offsetting requirement to uh, uh, improve the management effectiveness of those protected areas or to expand uh, the area under protection. Uh, and so, because protected areas are, of course, a key uh, tool in the toolbox for conservation, uh, um, offsets uh, uh, which aim to uh, uh, conserve or restore biodiversity uh, often use protected areas as, as a mechanism for implementation. Some people might think that it was wrong tying funding of protected areas to the loss of biodiversity uh, to de development. Uh, what, what do you say to those people? Uh, I would say that they're right to be concerned, that it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of risks uh, uh, that come with this proposition of getting protected areas and conservation funded by basically uh, uh, environmental harm. Um, but I, I think I would say I would say two things. One is that the, the the current business as usual in many of these countries is that you have the harm and you don't have the protected areas. Uh, so uh, as an optimist, I would say that um, it, it it can still be an improvement. Um, but but really, what we discussed this morning in our session was. Uh, um, 
a, an approach that actively aligns this offsetting requirement and the mitigation hierarchy more generally with uh, quantitative targets for biodiversity at a national scale or, or a landscape scale. And, in that, in, in, and if you apply this approach, uh, you uh, have a much better handle uh, on the risk of uh, uh, businesses greenwashing uh, their impact uh, through contributions to, say, a protected area network, um, but that in the end uh, uh, entails a net loss of biodiversity uh, for the country, when in fact uh, you would want uh, those developers and those and the private sector to, to actively contribute to achieving uh, um, the biodiversity goals that a country has set for itself. So you think your calculation will actually stop companies uh, greenwashing when they're using uh, a biodiversity offsetting as a uh, as as a tool? Um, so there are many dimensions to this. <laughs> Uh, but one uh, important element of adopting a more quantitative approach and a more traceable approach to the way offsets are uh, designed and sized uh, is that you make explicit the losses and the gains, uh, so the losses from the development impacts uh, and the gains from the offsetting, uh, and, and um, more transparency, more traceability in the decisions uh, hopefully will make uh, businesses more accountable uh, to the outcomes than if uh, the way they manage their impacts is uh, left to uh, uh, you know, backroom negotiations uh, about uh, financial payments, for example. So you've come up with this new calculation. Uh, what next? Uh, obviously, it was great in your brainstorming session, but how does this then change uh, the way that biodiversity targets are set at national level? And of course, we're now looking, hopefully, uh, towards the CBD in Kunming in China, either this year or perhaps next year. Well, so what was interesting is that some countries uh, have uh, adopted this approach. An example was the United Kingdom, uh, which requires for some projects a net gain of, of plus 10 percent of biodiversity for each project through restoration. Uh, but that plus 10 percent net gain uh, is not something that is uh, found in the country's commitments to, to under the Convention on Biological Diversity, for example. And so uh, what we hope is that we, we can make that alignment uh, and uh, uh, from the discussion we had, it, it's quite apparent that the biggest challenge isn't the mathematics of calculating how much offset uh, is required for a given development, but rather to actually get governments to uh, come up with quantitative targets from which we can make those calculations. Um, and so that is indeed the next step. Uh, um, in the coming months, and hopefully in, in, in China at the end of the year, uh, some quantitative targets like this will emerge. And, and what uh, tools are you going to be using uh, to make sure that governments do uh, set quantitative targets? Um, so we're working with uh, um, conservation organizations and, and scientists from around the world that have that are working together under various joint initiatives to push uh, for this uh, approach. Um, and in particular, we're doing this uh, under the, the, a, a new thematic group that was established uh, under the, com the Commission for Ecosystem Management of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, so this thematic group um, was created last year to bring together uh, expertise and provide guidance on how to uh, uh, apply this approach. Uh, and so we will be present at the World Conservation Congress that will uh, be, um, that will take place in September in France uh, and we'll be advocating for this. Uh, so that, that's one important tool. So building this community of practice that can push for, for this uh, improved approach. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, that's what's within our reach. Uh, but then, of course, governments need to uh, uh, um, take their responsibility in terms of, of making those kinds of, of uh, commitments. 
Absolutely. Well, Fabian, thank you very, very much for sharing with us the findings uh, from your brainstorming session. And I wish you all of the luck in the world. Uh, first of all, at the IUCN uh, Congress, which I think is in Marseille in uh, uh, September. And then, of course, with really advocating for these uh, quantitative and fairer uh, targets to be set. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Well, it's been an afternoon, I think, of insights. Uh, we have got lots of different opinions about these targets that have been set for 30% of the world's uh, lands and oceans to be protected by uh, 2030. Are they realistic? Can they be done? Given that the last targets set at the COP10 in Aichi in Japan were not met, although for protected areas, uh, they did quite well. And we heard from South Africa that South Africa uh, managed uh, almost uh, to get to the 17% target. But but by 2030, we've got to get to a 30% target. And it's not just South Africa, it's all countries. And how is this going to be done? So there was a lot of discussion about the need for public-private uh, partnerships, uh, good investment uh, for protected areas, because many of the existing ones are not so well managed. Uh, and Africa really needs that support. And we saw that there are funds from the EU for biodiversity uh, and that they are going to go up uh, by 2026, I think it's 10% uh, of the MFF budget, which is good news. But I think one of the things that we're also hearing is about this one society approach. So there is governments, uh, there's the private sector, but there's also civil society. And that really they can make a difference if they are funded correctly. Just as we heard uh, from the CEPF, which has funded many, many civil society groups in some of the major biodiversity hotspots around the world and has produced results. But of course, at an individual level, we are going to have to change our rate of production and uh, consumption and we're going to have to value nature more and really realize the value of these ecosystem services uh, that it is nature that uh, provides the supply of clean water and food and medicines and of course is very useful for the carbon sequestration, the, ca the carbon sinks uh, in the combat against climate uh, change. And that climate change and biodiversity, uh, they're two sides of the same coin. And that both need to be uh, worked on in 2021, if it's really to be a year of transformative change. Well, I would like to thank all of our speakers, some of the world's leading conservationists and environmental policy makers, as well as some of the youth leaders uh, for sharing their very valuable time with us this afternoon. But please do continue to stay tuned because there's a closing ceremony with some very high level speakers and some well-known faces. And we're also going to uh, get the results of a high-level panel of experts that's been putting together uh, eight uh, priority uh, program uh, areas uh, for biodiversity, uh, halting biodiversity and ensuring we value nature. So please do go to Channel One. That's all from me, Claire Dool. Goodbye. <laughs>